Welcome to TD Synex's 30 Minutes with a Hacker. Thanks everyone for joining this next episode of 30 Minutes with a Hacker. My name is Jade Witte with TD Cinex. And if you hadn't heard the announcement on September 1st of 2021, Tech Data merged with Cinex to form the world's largest IT distribution company. So we're super excited about that. It really gives us the ability to have an impact globally in um, helping to train and help our partners and work with different vendors to really have the biggest impact on cybersecurity as possible. I've got uh, with me here today, and I think we're gonna really enjoy the conversation today. It's about cybercrime and really unveiling that whole area. There's a lot of misconceptions around it. But as we're getting into the discussion, I would like Brett, maybe you and Alex to just introduce yourself and give a little bit of background. So my name is Alex Riles. I lead the global security business for TD Cinex. I've been with the company for almost 10 years now, I guess, running various aspects of our security business from security services to solution development to the vendors that we manage and uh, really enjoy it. So thank you, Jade, for letting me be here. My name is Brett Scott. Prior to my uh, being a director here at TD Cynics, I founded the National Cyber Warfare Foundation. I've been a programmer since a very young age and uh, I have deep technical hands-on background. So I think it's important, you know, a lot of people don't know Brett or Alex's real depth of background, but suffice to say they lead kind of the charge as we are building our team and helping. But I think it would be great just to touch on a few of the things that we do from a cybersecurity perspective, the cyber range that's been developed. We analyze and research malware. We're collecting threat intelligence for malware research. We have a whole team that does that. We manage red and blue teams, train them on how to do that effectively. We work with the top vendors in cybersecurity on a global basis, and we're constantly learning about the new threats and how, how we can protect against it. And we're training our partners in this space. So we, we do things like this podcast. We have all kinds of trainings that we do. It's all about how do we educate? How do we help fight the fight? Because it's a very real fight that's going on right, right now. The cyber criminals, they collaborate, they work together, they share information. And we tend to not do that so much. So we really are kind of behind the eight ball. And we're doing everything that we can from a TD Cynic perspective to help fight that. We wanted to get into this discussion about unveiling cybercrime. And as we're kind of getting into it, I think it would be good to uh, talk about who makes up the world of cybercrime. I don't know which one of you guys want to take that on first. Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, so cybercrime is a, a massive industry. I think that uh, it was estimated a year or two ago that cybercrime is on the UN actually estimated that globally it's two trillion dollars in organized crime and a big focus of organized crime in addition to um, theft and smuggling and and uh, pornography and counterfeit a large part of it has a cyber crime aspect to it and that is perpetrated by organized crime groups as well as nation states. Almost 80% of cybercrime actually is um, through nation state or organized crime groups. Organized is kind of an interesting term because it's not quite as organized as the name sounds sometimes. It can be a very decentralized model, but definitely um, organized crime is a big part of that as well as the nation states, uh, the big players who invest uh, billions into their cyber industries. Yeah, the the state of uh, cyber crime or cyber threat actors has really evolved quite quickly. And it is at the time when we, the people who are being attacked, get to be our weakest, that's when they are truly innovating and investing to, get, to become the strongest. So we have, we are living in an active cyber war that's going on 24 seven where nation states work with uh, organized crime groups, working with hacktivists, working with all kinds of people who have actual talent in cyber to effect uh, the same types of objectives you would achieve with warfare or even terrorism. Brett, what do you think their main motivation is? The criminal, I, mean, I guess it goes probably the gamut, right? There's no set, but I'm curious to get your perspective on that. 
Well, it's, it's usually money first, uh, but then on top of that, there are uh, some very long game things going in play. Um, so there is a fight for uh, becoming the global currency of choice. There's a fight for uh, whose currency is used for buying and selling oil. There are all kinds of things that um, there are government related motivations. Uh, sometimes it's a political motivation. Sometimes it's simply a uh, sort of an ideological uh, objective, but all of those things basically are subordinate to the primary cause, which is stealing people's money and intellectual property. Yeah, I would add to that, that um, while most, I agree with Brett, most organized and cyber crime is focused around money, um, there are pockets of groups and people who have some other motivations in addition to the politics and other things, like just the thrill of breaking the law. I mean, some people just like to see, kind of get away with it. They have a day job during the day, they go work for some company is it in IT, they come home at night and um, have a little side business, a side hustle um, that, that's about breaking the law. Sometimes it's about the challenge of cracking a system. You know, can you in fact get the passwords from your company's IT system and then crack them with some big rainbow table and try to get access to company assets? Not that you might even steal them. You just want to know, can you do it? Um, some people are focused around bragging rights uh, in the hacking industry, especially in the dark web. They like to brag. In order to get access to the dark web, oftentimes you have to have credentials. People have to know who you are by your hacker name and bragging on various exploits is one way that, that you do that to get more access to, uh, to various dark web forums so you can buy and sell your goods or do whatever you're doing. So. There's just lots of motivation, but ultimately, I do think most of it comes back to money. How would you guys describe, you know, you have organized crime. How, would, how is it organized? How would you guys, you know, look at the structure of it? And I think there's some misconceptions around that. So, you know, when you think of cyber crime, which whether it's a division of organized crime or not, what I think is amazing is that so many times in other countries like Russia, China, uh, North Korea, these, these organized crime units that focus in cyber look like any other company you've ever seen. There was actually a story, uh, I read a book recently that's really good, I recommend it. The name of the book is Future Crimes. It's written by Mark Goodman, M-A-R-C. Um, we actually had Mark come speak to us uh, at a conference we hosted here at, at Tech Data a, a, a few years ago. But in his book, he talks about one of the early examples of organized cybercrime was a company called Innovative Marketing. And they found it out of the Ukraine because the Ukrainian government doesn't ask a whole lot of questions about what goes on inside of companies. And they grew from two founders up to, uh, I think in 2009, they were almost $180 million. And over a three-year period, they made $500 million. Innovative Marketing sounds like a normal company. They had a CEO a CFO, a CIO, they had an IT department, they had an HR department, they had everything you would expect out of a normal company, including a tech support hotline. But the product they sold was they would inject code into random websites so that when you as an unsuspecting user would go to that website, there would be JavaScript that would pop up a pop-up box in front of your browser that makes it look like there's a virus scan happening. They would quote, scan your computer and you would see a little meter happening as the scan was progressing. It was all fake, but the user doesn't know that. And at the end, it would come up and say that you have 25 different versions of viruses on your computer and you, know, you need to do something right away. Well, the whole message was fake, but they would of course offer a solution and they had a product that they were selling called System Defender. And it was $49. And it would pop, a, a, a pop up and say, if you want us to clean these 25 viruses from your computer, click this link and, and buy our System Defender. It's only $49.99. And you would uh, click the link and enter your credit card information. And as probably no surprise, you would never get the actual product. But they would sell your credit card data um, about an hour later online in the dark web forums. So they made $500 million globally over three years with this bit of a scam. And it all started with some coders who had an idea to trick people into thinking they, were, they had viruses on their computer. Now, later versions of this obviously worked their way into what we call ransomware today. But 
Uh, that's a great example of how you can have companies that function like any other company in society with, with an HR department and IT support, you know, uh, 1-800 uh, troubleshooting line. It's, uh, it's pretty scary how organized cybercrime can be in various countries. Yeah, you know, what's funny is that, um, especially in America, we have this idea that criminals are living under rocks or, you know, in dark corners or alleys, et cetera. And the fact is, is that most of these organizations are actually more professional than yours. They have better resourcing, they have better talent, they have all kinds of other things because they've invested heavily in their one and only business, which is stealing from you. And they are playing on confirmation bias. You assume they're a bunch of criminals with bad language and all kinds of other um, things that you would think are identifiable. But the fact is, is that they're just really, really amazing at being good at faking you out. And because of that, you, you don't stand a chance because your own bias prevents you from observing what is obviously illegal type behavior. Uh, I literally just over the weekend, uh, the, the Labor Day weekend, was fighting a, a, a company spoofing healthcare in every state in America and they had a massive infrastructure uh, that involved email, text messaging, uh, phone calls, the whole deal, uh, all centered around, around stealing people's money. And so that kind of operation doesn't generally exist. Most corporations would be envious of, the, of, the, of what these people have. And the reason why they're so good is because they invest. I mean, uh, the, what's amazing to me is, you know, there are towns in, or in foreign countries where the entire county is run by a couple of hackers and everyone protects them because they are all dependent upon the success of that hacker out in the world. And uh, so there's this massive support infrastructure around that. I mean, what company wouldn't love having the entire county supporting them and everything that they're doing in every way possible? Um, they, the bad guys, have advantage over the rest of us because they are better organized, better resourced, and they're absolutely more focused. It sounds like that's a misconception that they're just kind of willy-nilly and they're not really structured, but there's got to be some differences. What would, you, what would you guys say is different about how they approach it? Well, from a cynical cybersecurity professional's perspective, um, they start by accepting that the world is full of dangerous things and they need to protect themselves and invest in things that keep the bad guys away. So they're really good at investing in cybersecurity defense. Um, but also importantly, uh, they if your only job is to go steal other people's money, you can do it any time of the day or night, their work hours or whatever they want them to be. And they can run operations anywhere because they can actually offer people good paying jobs. And all those people have to do is kind of overlook the fact that they are, they're bringing evil to the world, right? Um, a lot of people get over that. Uh, so we really, really, um, especially in America, are not used to an asymmetric is also superior in technology, talent, and resources. Uh, and that's a problem that we are continuously trying to grapple with, and it harms us every time. Yeah, I would add to that that as much as there's a centralized model for the uh, underworld with companies who look like real companies, there's also a very decentralized model at play. That's another way it's different from a normal company. There are a lot of people out there who specialize in unique skills. You might have someone who is really good at the offensive hacking. They can get you into the company. You might have another skilled person who knows how to take the, the, uh, the data and, and do something with it to turn it into cash. Another person who's good at money laundering. You know, what, I think one of the most challenging parts of this cybercrime industry is laundering the money. So even if you're getting Bitcoin with ransomware, Bitcoin is, is absolutely traceable, unlike kind of the, I, I think the general thought out there. And so you have a lot of government agencies that, that trace that money, but uh, there's a concept out there in the, in the hacking world called money mules. And there, it, it's a, there's an interesting decentralized model where uh, these bad guys will go out and recruit people to work, uh, recruit them to work for a front company, and they'll they'll put out ads to be a regional assistant or a payment processing agent, and you sign on to a company you think it's a legitimate job. They tell you you need two bank accounts, one account for us to deposit your paycheck into, the other account you'll use for your payment processing for this front company, 
And then before you know it, you're uh, six months in and you find out from a call from the FBI that, that it turns out you've been laundering money for some organized crime organization uh, dealing with cybercrime. And you had no idea because you would just take funds, you would run them through your personal bank account with your personal information on it. And then do you think those front companies would stand up for you once you're busted by the feds? Of course not. They leave you hanging out to dry. And so then the bad guys are off to get another mule to launder their money for them. So one of the reasons that the growth in cybercrime isn't more than it is today is the money laundering piece is oftentimes a huge challenge for them to, uh, to solve. And it's constantly having to evolve and change. So we talk about how is it different than a big company. I would say there's a very decentralized model out there with specialist people who come together in a swarm for a project. You need a guy who's good at DDoS stuff. You need a guy who's good at the money laundering. You need a guy who's good at the, the attack vector. Uh, you need a project manager, if you will, to pull it all together. And they don't always know the bigger plan. They're hired to do a job with their specific skill and they do it and they get paid and they have no idea what the bigger goal was or what the bigger hack might have been oftentimes. So there's a, there's a really fascinating organized decentralized model to this underworld in a lot of cases. Alex, you mentioned that they have different skill sets, right? You know, someone's great at getting credentials or someone's great at money laundering. How, how do they get those skills? Like, is it is it something that they just learn on their own? Like, do you have any insight into how they actually develop that ability? So uh, let me give you a couple of examples. So in Russia, for example, um, it's one of the few countries where the hackers actually want to be arrested and actually want to be sent to prison. And the reason why is because that's where they train you. Uh, so you're in prison and they teach you how, and they give you these very highly special specialized skill sets uh, which you then go out and then use, uh, you know, from other Russia, right? But, uh, you know, in China, for example, China treats hacking and hacking, hacking activity like America treats baseball. You know, from a very young age, you can get yourself in the Pee Wee League and you can grow all the way through to Major League Baseball and all the way along the way, there are a hundred appellate things that support that. So they are farming, if you will, um, hacker talent and whatever they can't farm they acquire so for example if you go out and win a hacking competition anywhere in the world really good chance you're going to get visited by china and they're going to ask, offer you an awful lot of money to come help them do their things and so those are two ways that that, that are done in other countries for example where uh the the environment is so repressive and opportunity so rare why well, wouldn't you dedicate your life to something that would change your life, right? So if you're living in a country where you, you couldn't own a home until your 70s, you're not going to be able to own a car for you know, like 20 years, you know, you might say, golly, if I just learn a set of skills and then go steal from these idiot Americans that won't protect themselves, um, I can have everything I want. I can live an amazing lifestyle. So it, because there are all of these repressed economies, because there are all of these areas where there's just really no opportunity for anything to do anything good, uh, and it's so easy to take advantage of us being so bad at what we do, um, that is breeding this very special thing. And there are, within the hacking world, um, there are many different entities that will train you on specific skill sets. Because again, those uh, organized uh, bad guys, whether it be nation state and or hackerism, they are always looking for capable cyber warriors. They are willing to train people to get them up to speed. And so they have a process of refinement. They'll find the, 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 the willing, they will enable them, and then they will put them out and, and doing the stuff. So again, this investment cycle that's out there all is contingent upon us being terrible at protecting our stuff. Yeah, it's amazing to me how much content is out there on the surface web, but also in the dark web for specifically training hackers to be hackers. There's some amazing content and a lot of it's free. It's an entire cyber crime university in a way uh, out there in especially in the dark web in certain forums. If you can get into those forums, then they have training material, they have exercises, they teach you how to build a phishing email, they build you, uh, teach you how to uh, launch a ransomware attack. And, and there's all sorts of threads around which ransomware variants are the right ones to use for different use cases in different industries. There's just a tremendous amount of knowledge. It is a very collaborative ecosystem, I would say, because they all feed off of each other, right? 
they, uh, because, because of this swarm concept I talked about earlier, where you might have a project where you need to go after a certain company or a country or a state, you would pull together a team, right? And it's in your best interest to have people to pull from. So a lot of people will write content and put them out there uh, to teach people skills so that there's always a plethora of resources available to commit different types of hacking. And there are a lot, right? There's people who specialize in IoT device compromise. There's people who specialize in telecommunication compromise. Uh, you kind of get a skill set and you cultivate it and you become, build a name for yourself in one specific skill or industry. And then you get called on uh, to help out. And there's even registries out there, kind of like LinkedIn in a way, conceptually, where you can explain your exploits and people can look that up to, to build their teams or whatever needs to happen. Well, they also have contracting, right? So if you, are, if you are just an aspiring talent, you don't have all the pieces that you need to be effective, you can contract out certain services. So there are quite literally phishing email writing firms. And you simply say, this is my target uh, and here, here's what I want to do to them. And they will craft for you a very well-constructed email. And many of those firms also do research on the target. And so they are trying to increase the efficacy of, the, of those click-throughs so again, you don't even have to have an awful lot of talent. If you have the motivation and maybe a little bit of resourcing, you can leverage friends within the internet, which is kind of a misnomer, but you can leverage these resources to help you affect damage and then of course receive gain from that, which funds your own research and uh, you know mortgage payments, et cetera. This is a bit of an aside, but since you mentioned it, it just popped in my head. I was at DEF CON this year, a few months ago in Vegas, and there I went to a session on how they've designed artificial intelligence engines now to write phishing emails. So we're long past the days of, of phishing emails sounding like you know broken English from a guy in Mongolia. Now it's it's computer generated, AI generated phishing emails that are very convincing. Like they were showing samples of a human written and, and machine written phishing scams. And it's it's insanely um, hard to tell the difference. And now you can pay for a service to breath point where you pay someone a uh, dollar amount to a company who auto generates these emails and gives them to you so you can launch your campaign. It's, it's gotten incredibly sophisticated. But one of the common factors with all these guys are sharing information and helping each other, but they're, they're criminals. They're dishonest people. So how do they trust each other enough to actually go into business together? Touch on that a little bit. Well, for starters, they don't. I mean, the, uh, the fact is, is that they are working off of aligned interests, right? So um, I've literally seen people who are existential thousand year enemies of each other, and they'll collaborate on all kinds of attacks. So it's quite literally one of those things where they go to the office and they help each other out. But when they walk out the office door, they're screaming and fighting with each other. Um, that's just the nature of it. Because they have a common enemy, they are willing to align with each other to harm that other party. And so that's just an, uh, another concept that we Americans don't understand. We, we'd like to think that we have integrity to our own political beliefs or our own religious beliefs, whatever it is, and we, we follow it, uh, you know, to use a metaphor, religiously. And that's something that is not of the hacker world. Uh, the hacker world is what am I trying to get done right now? Who's going to help me do that? And then if somebody violates those rules, like that person is uh, trying to subvert you or harm your initiative, only then do you care. And only then do you get into a, into a combat, if you will, with those folks. It does happen, but it is actually a rare thing because all of those people are trying to get one thing, which is the resourcing and steal the money and intellectual property. So to crossfire with each other is entirely counterproductive and a really good way to get yourself ostracized within the hacker community is to be one of those people that get just kind of fishes out and starts doing crossfire. They need you going north-south the whole time. Focus on the enemy, get that done, do whatever you want in your personal life. But when we're working, big metaphor there, uh, we are focused on getting what we need done. So that it overcomes all of the things that we who believe that we are sticking to our beliefs, um, we can't understand it because we don't, we, we don't know anybody like that. And again, that's their advantage. They have the ability that we are slow moving and, uh, and predictable, whereas they are agile and motivated. Yeah, there's that old adage, there's honor among thieves. But I would argue that there can be a code of conduct. 
uh, among thieves. And, and the hacker community does have a bit of a code of conduct. It's not followed 100%, of course, but um, for the most part, the, they play by the rules because it's so difficult to subvert your local government wherever you live. And, and it takes a teamwork effort to have an underground community. So they do more or less follow some general rules and the reprisals for not following the rules can be pretty a steep, pretty steep penalty. You can get kicked out of access to the forums that are your livelihood. You can, um, in the worst case scenario, be, be attacked by a group, you know, who if you are dishonest and turn over some data that's not exactly what you said it was. So there's a bit of a code of conduct. There's an expectation of how you should behave. And then of course there's penalties for not behaving uh, like there is in any society. So um, it definitely not an environment where I would say you trust everybody, but you certainly uh, can expect some level of following the rules for the benefit of the community. So let's talk about that a little bit more about where do you, where do you find these people? They, there is this code of conduct, they are sharing information, but where, where do you go to get products and tools and get onto these forums where you can meet people that could possibly be someone that you would partner up with on something? So there's, there's several concepts there and we probably don't have time to get too deep into it, but, but at a conceptual level, there's what we call the surface web. That's what you think of as Google searching. Google surf searches publicly available websites. Then you have a concept called the deep web. The deep web is everything Google can't see. Uh, that doesn't mean it's nefarious. That doesn't mean it's bad. That just means it's behind corporate firewalls. And imagine, um, it, it turns out 99% of the internet is actually deep web. Only 1% is, is surface web. Because imagine all the companies out there who have web servers and th internal corporate networks with all the data on them, Google can't see any of that. Within that deep web, you have a small subset that we call the dark web or the dark net. And that is a set of resources that Google also can't see because it's protected by a set of uh, devices we call onion routers. And the only way to get access to this dark web which is a subset of the deep web, is with a special browser. Well, there's several ways to access it. One of the more common ways is with a browser called Tor, T-O-R. Uh, Tor connects to onion routers, which are just web servers and proxy servers like most others, but they're all connected and isolated from the normal sur surface web. And on there, people can stand up their own onion router with their own website that has special content or, or forums, we call them dark web forums, that focus on different things. Not all of the, the dark web was actually created by government agencies as a way for countries to communicate in environments where they weren't allowed to communicate on the surface web. But it has degraded into um, probably 80% of it being a bit nefarious, uh, buying and selling of drugs, weapons, contraband, child pornography, uh, hacking exploits and, and things like that uh, is kind of what it's degraded into most of it because it is assumed to be a, a bit anonymous. The source IP address you're coming from and the destination IP address of the server you're going to are uh, obfuscated from view and it's very difficult to track your where you go and what you buy and what you sell on the dark web for that reason. Now, I'm not going to go as far as to say it's impossible to track. I think that um, we could safely say that there are mechanisms out there for certain government agencies to, to know some things about what happens in the dark web. But as a general rule, it is, generally speaking, um, pretty anonymous. Well, yeah, it, I would first of all encourage anyone who is like, wow, that's Tor. What is that? Do not use Tor. Do not get on that place. Uh, you would you would be much safer walking into a pit filled with vipers, alligators, and angry gorillas, and walking out unscathed. Uh, just uh, that's where really bad people are. A level of bad people you don't understand. So this is not for casual curiosity. Uh, read articles. But the fact is, is that uh, there are multiple ways that you can get yourself into the uh, the underbelly of the internet. And uh, what to Alex's point, it is absolutely true. If you rise to a level of interest from a government or a police agency to where they're willing to invest the time and energy to come get you, 
nothing can stop them from doing that. But everyone is operating on budgets, so the police doesn't have the police don't have the ability to go to that effort to fight everybody. So that for those people who are thinking you're elite hackers and getting away with stuff, brother and sister, you are not that good. You're just simply not that important. So don't let your head uh, fill the void of, I didn't have my door kicked in this morning to make you think you're really good at hacking. Uh, the fact is it's probably just not interesting enough yet for some government to do that. So uh, that it is one of those things where um, the, 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 the proliferation of all of this bad activity is so bad that no government is able to afford to actually stamp it out. And because of that, we have the thriving cybercrime industry. Now, to, to that point, by the way, you know, if we, the other people, the normal people, the good guys, if we were to collaborate and work with each other and share information and do all of those things, we wouldn't need the government to do that for us. And we would help really stamp these folks out much, much easier. It is only because the people on the quote unquote good guy, the blue teamers, think that they're an elite James Bond protecting their one company. They don't want to tell anybody. They just want to speak to the next conference because they operate in these little silos that, again, enables the bad guys to predate upon us. And it makes the problem of stopping them almost impossible. So maybe we could stop being egotistical idiots and start working together. I think commercial security companies you know, are trying to fight this battle. It feels like such an uphill uphill um ball to wall and i feel like we're we're way behind i don't know if you guys want to touch a little bit on some of the things that have you know recent innovations that have come about that we're having to fight against and maybe as we're closing this get into some of the the ways that companies can protect themselves right now yeah i'm glad you asked that jay because this has been a lot of doom and gloom discussion interesting right and it's reality and so it is important that we understand it but it's not all hopeless, right? So there are absolutely things companies can do to protect themselves from cybercrime. Uh, and it, it's, it has to be more than a firewall at the point. So we like to teach our customers, think of security in terms of a holistic perspective. And I've used the house analogy many times, but it's not enough to have a big fat front door, right? You, uh, if your back door is a screen door and your windows don't have locks on them, you need to have a lot of cybersecurity uh, protecting all the avenues of entry into your company. That's email security. That's going to be security products on your endpoint devices. That's going to certainly be uh, firewalls, of course, for your network security. That's cloud security for all your cloud workloads running in Amazon and Azure. Uh, you need to think about all the avenues coming in, including IoT devices that connect to your corporate networks, your Wi-Fi connections uh, in your lobby of your building. All those things have to be evaluated. And, and I would most highly recommend a zero trust architecture. We have another podcast where we went into detail on what that means, but suffice it to say that you have to uh, not trust anybody implicitly and retrust them on a regular basis. It's not enough to say, great, thanks for that password. You're now in forever. It's thanks for the password. I'm gonna basically re-verify you. And there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, you know, two hours from now or six hours from now. I might not be looking, asking you to enter your password again, but maybe I'm looking at the way you type and the websites you go to and the resources you access and looking at, does that match the pattern of your normal behavior, yes or no? And if not, maybe then I do ask you for credentials again, uh, as long as it falls in line with what you normally do in your day, I'm not gonna re-verify. But zero trust is critical to protecting against uh, cybercrime and as, as well as email security because we all know 80% of, uh, of malware and threats come in through people clicking bad links and emails they shouldn't click. Yeah, it, it starts with embracing the reality, right? So this, I, I agree, Alex, it's been kind of doomy and gloomy, and I'm sorry, I kind of get into a downward spiral on this one. So the fact is, is that start with the reality. You, as a good guy or girl, are facing an asymmetric, massively overwhelming highly resourced, they have better money, they have better talent, they have better everything than you do. You're fighting a war against that. And if you think you're going to succeed alone, go take a look in the mirror, you're looking at a dead person. What you need to do is you need to go out and find help. You need to find help from competent cyber workers. I didn't say certified, I didn't say anything. You need people who know how to actually do cyber and can actually do it themselves. Find those people. And when you can't find those people, find the organizations that did find those people 
and then buy services and products from them. So for example, if you're a small business, you're not gonna be able to go out and spend the you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for a competent cyber warrior, but you can hire an MSSP that is very affordably able to watch your networks and alert you when there are problems. You can afford good backup technologies. There are lots of things that you can do to invest, to enlist help from, from those people who have competency in cybersecurity and one of the great places that you can go to to find, hey, where do I find these people? How do I do these things? This is where you find a partner for Tech Data Cynics, and we can absolutely help you with that process because Tech Data Cynics, being the massive corporation we are, have the ability to attract and retain the very best cybersecurity talent. But because we are a distributor, the only way you have access to that talent is if you work through one of our partners. Working together, we can be successful. And with that, we should probably wrap this up. I know we went just a couple of minutes over, but I really appreciate both Alex and Brett, your, your willingness to share your insights and thoughts. And we'll just keep churning these out. I think that this is one way that we can fight against it is just by educating ourselves and, and not putting blinders on and just, just getting out there and making the right steps, doing the right things that we do learn about and putting those actually into action. So with that, we'll wrap this up and we we'll look forward to next month's podcast on 30 Minutes with the Hackers. Thanks, everyone.